Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Uh, welcome to our panel on the youth imperative, which we think, at least, uh, that this is probably the most important subject that is going to be discussed uh, this uh, uh, today. Youth is uh, the biggest challenge and, in my view, the biggest opportunity in the region. We have uh, a fantastic uh, panel with us uh, with all sorts of capabilities and knowledge and activism uh, in, in their areas. Let me introduce them and then I let them, uh, if you don't mind, uh, frame uh, the discussion and tell us what do they think uh, is the most important uh, opportunities that we are missing in addressing the youth uh, challenge in, in the Arab world today. Uh, to my left, uh, I have uh, Budur Al Qasimi. Uh, she is the chairperson of the Sharjah uh, Investment Authority. She is also an entrepreneur and she is an activist in, in women uh, issues. And then we have uh, uh, Omar Al Ghanim, banker, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and runs uh, a family business. And then we have uh, Dr. Mahmoud Jibril, politician. Prime Minister, uh, served as Prime Minister uh, of Libya for a while, and he is, uh, and much very relevant to our subject today, an expert in training and strategy, and has spent years uh, uh, going through training programs across uh, the region. And then we have Princess Carolina de Bourbon Parma. She's an activist, and she's the representative for partnerships in Switzerland for the United Nations Relief Works Agency for the Palestinians uh, uh, UNRWA. Uh, welcome to you all. Welcome to my panel. I'll, st I'll start with, uh, with Budur. Please frame the discussion for us. What is it that we're missing? Uh, thank you, Fadi. It's uh, an honor and privilege to be here. Uh, I want to start the discussion with sharing some stories with you about successful entrepreneurs that I personally know. So the first story of, is of this uh, young Jordanian woman. Her name is Noor Al-Hassan, and she set up a company called Terjama, which translates documents from Arabic to English. And the interesting thing is that she employs a lot of people who work from home, mainly women, and mainly in Saudi Arabia. So it gives them the flexibility to work and to get an income while they're still at home. Uh, the second story that I want to share with you is of Khalid Al Khadir, who I think is here today. Uh, he's a Saudi entrepreneur, and he's set up um, Glow Work, which is an amazing initiative that provides employment for Saudi women. And he told me yesterday that he places 26 women a day into jobs in Saudi Arabia. A commendable person, actually, for doing this. Uh, and thirdly, I want to talk about Najla al Mudfa, who's here as well today. She set up her company, Khayarat, which is a platform that helps young Emiratis get into the private sector. It offers them the training they need to get into the private sector. So these are just three stories of what's happening in our part of the world. And it just illustrates that actually, um, it's not all doom and gloom for the Arab millennials. There are actually good things happening. And we need to talk about these stories and share them. Uh, and I want to back it up with some statistics as well. Um, in the UAE, I think SMEs uh, contribute to about 94%. Uh, so there about 94% of the companies in UAE are SMEs, and they contribute to 60% of our GDP. 30% uh, of them are run by women. And I heard you say, Fadi, once in an interview that you get pitched an idea every single day I for do. a company, and you invest in one every two weeks. Is that correct? Something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, what does that show? It shows that, that, that things are happening in our part of the world, and we need to talk about these things. Thank you very much. But I want, I'm not going to leave you alone with this one. Let me throw some statistics at you, uh, specifically relating uh, uh, to youth and female uh, youth engagement in the economic cycle of the region. Let me tell you, female youth unemployment in the region is double of the male. So it's at 44%. 44%, it's practically half of them. While 50%, over 50% of uh, our university graduates are women. So there is a massive mismatch. Women participation in the job market in the region is at a mere nine, 18%. Mm -hmm. It varies from 
countries to countries. In Lebanon, it's a bit higher. In Saudi Arabia, it's different. In Jordan, it's at 18 percent. Uh, the most important statistic that I see is very relevant is raising employment rate for both young workers and women to the global average, to the global average, creates 58 million jobs in the region. So if we address the issue of bringing women into the workplace, then we're addressing 51, 58 million jobs. You say in one of your interviews, I strongly believe in the importance of equipping women Your Majesty and Your Highness, welcome. You say, I strongly, I, I believe strongly in the importance of equipping women to be active contributors in the development. So what do you mean by that? How can we actually bring our women youth who are uh, educated, highly educated, highly capable, but then suddenly something happens. They graduate and they're not part of the economic cycle. Why? What, what is it that we're not doing? There are a lot of factors, and I might not be able to touch on all of them, but yesterday I read something interesting actually in the Jordan Times. Uh, it's about, it was a story about this woman, her name was Wujdan Rabani, who wanted to study electrical engineering. And at the time, her parents and her family had said, actually, a woman to study electrical engineering, that's unheard of. You're not going to climb electricity poles. We've never heard of that. She actually you know, went ahead and studied electrical engineering, and you might know her now, she is actually the Secretary General of the Energy and Miner Mineral Commission in Jordan. So what does this story tell you? There are probably two things that I can take away from that. The first is perceived gender roles. We have to change the perceived gender roles that we have in our society, so we need to talk about that. And secondly, People like Wujdan, they need to be highlighted more. So it took somebody like her to break that barrier and go ahead and follow her dreams for more women to be able to do that. And that's just one aspect. Other aspects include we need to have more maternity leave, more legislations to support women, and also of, you know, parenting should be a shared responsibility between both the mother and the father. And in our part of the world, in our society, unfortunately, we don't see that so much. So many issues need to be addressed. Thank you. So, so you're saying it's, it's a bit cultural? It's cultural, but women need choices as well. So for example, we need to offer them flexible uh, work, we need to offer them part-time work, the option to work from home. And I think the more choices women have, the more likely they are going to become uh, uh, contributing to the economic uh, growth. Thank you. Uh, uh, Omar, you're, you're a banker, you're an entrepreneur and a philanthropist, you're, you're a very passionate uh, uh, giver, you're, you're very passionate about Injaz al-Arab. In a recent article uh, you wrote about six or eight months ago at, in the Huffington, Huffington Post, you say we need to have on our radar screens youth unemployment and reform and education. They go together. Uh, so wh what, is, wh what do you mean? What, what is it that is, we're missing in our education system uh, that does not get our youth the jobs that they need, specifically in the private sector? And that's the issue that you've been addressing for years. Yeah. <clears throat> Fadi, thank you. Uh, you know, if we look at the youth uh, across our region today, I, I think there are three key areas that we need to cover in order to be able to address that. First is building confidence. Second is job creation for that youth. And then a call to action for what, what, what we can do in order to be able to affect change for them. And if we think about the building confidence, uh, my company, we conducted a survey. 2,200 youth across the region, across the GCC and non-GCC countries. And we asked people who had started up companies what their number, what, what their issues were. And, and Fadi, you, you work with entrepreneurs all the time. When you ask an entrepreneur what their biggest issue is, it's running out of money. You know, my burn rate, how much cash I have left. And sadly, amongst entrepreneurs in our part of the world, the number one issue they had was government regulations. Number two was running out of capital, but number one was government regulations. And people who we wanted to start up companies, but didn't, uh, weren't able to. Their, their number one uh, factor for not doing that was fear of failure. And in a part of the world where we don't have bankruptcy laws, in many of the countries, and many, people, many young entrepreneurs face uh, criminal liability when, when a company fails, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of risk around that. So you know, we, we, we really need to build confidence amongst our youth. And then we need to create some job. We need to create some jobs for them as well. 
And you know, we look at one of the themes of, t of the, the WEF session today, it's infrastructure. We spend 5% on our infrastructure, whereas Asia spends 15%. So we've been seriously underspending on our infrastructure. And that's something that could create a lot of jobs for our youth right now. I mean, so we, we talk about changing our education systems. And yes, you know, we spend a lot in education, and we're not getting the yield on that spend. And we're not creating enough critical thinkers who are going out there and coming up with the right types of solutions that we need in the private sector. But what are things we can do now? We could spend more on infrastructure and create more uplift and create more efficient economies that have more trade. There's only 10% inter-Arab trade. Europe has 70% trade. Uh, policy in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, 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 the bankruptcy laws and creating laws that are more, more make it easier for banks to be able to fund SMEs, some risk sharing uh, there, and I think we'll touch on some of those things later, and, and education. I mean, so more getting critical thinking involved, earlier stages. So getting people, getting people with the types of skill sets. If you go to Silicon Valley, and you go and you ask what degree people have in Silicon Valley, it's typically not about the degree, it's about the type of thinking they can do. Uh, whereas in our part of the world, we're so caught up with what degree and teaching that specific subject matter, but not teaching how to think. And we need, we need our education systems to teach how to think more. Because when you have that, that's when you come up to the solutions with, with like an Airbnb, where you create a parallel industry with, with capacity that was just there. And, and you, you, you solve problems, innovate, innovative type of problem sets. Um, yeah. so, I, I, so I wanna challenge you on a couple of things. Please. As, as, as a banker and as a private sector employer. It, so what is it that the private sector can do uh, for, to encourage employment? Uh, uh, what are you doing as a big company for startups, for instance? Uh, what are you as a bank, and, and we know that banks are shying away from giving uh, loans uh, to small and medium-sized enterprises, and there certainly is the big issue of availability of capital uh, for startups and, and to, to create that entrepreneurial uh, uh, environment in our region. So why do banks shy away? You know, there is a $260 billion gap in financing SMEs in the region. It must be a very lucrative business for you. I mean, but and only 8% of, of the bank loan portfolio is to small and medium-sized businesses, and it's only 4% in the Gulf. So you're at, at, at the lowest level in the Gulf. So, and, and then yet you have a huge unemployment problem with your nationals. What's the problem? I mean, what is it, why don't you take risks on your entrepreneurs? So l let, me, let me cover the first part. As for what, what do we do as a big company, and, and how do we foster entrepreneurship? Um, so we're, we're involved with many things, but you, you mentioned in Jazz, and, and that's a program that we're very involved with. Uh, and uh, you know, I uh, involved with it across the region. And, and Jazz now uh, puts 400,000 youth through the program. And if you look at the sample set of people who go through the program, uh, as opposed to sample sets of people who didn't, the, the level of entrepreneurship increases fourfold. So it really does teach these young people the, the skills and, and what's required to be successful in the private sector and to be a successful entrepreneur. So, so that's, that's one thing that we spend a tremendous amount of resources, a tremendous amount of time getting involved in and trying to teach young people how to be entrepreneurs. The SME problem, I, I, I think you're right. I think the banks should be doing more to fund SMEs. I'm, I'm happy to say that, that the, the bank that I'm chairman of, Gulf Bank, has, has just come up with a, with a new SME funding program uh, that we've, that we've uh, done together, which is a first for, for the region as far as I know which is where we've done risk sharing with the government, um, where the government takes part of the risk for the portfolio for the startup companies, and, and the bank assumes part of that risk as well. And the rationale, we, we pitched to the government, the rationale was, we as a bank, if you put our money on the line as well, are better at choosing the credit risk than the governments are. Governments typically don't have good investment track records. Uh, but, but if you make the risk reward for us a little bit better by sharing some of the risk with us as well, then we're gonna invest a lot more in this. And, and this, ha this is not, nothing new. This exists all over the world, and, but it's just re-implementing it. And now we've been running it for two months and I'm happy to say we're getting some traction on it. Uh, Fantastic, and then, then there's an innovative program that just came out of, from the government of Kuwait of availing two billion Kuwaiti dinars, that's seven billion dollars for startups and for, for yeah, uh, that, we're, we're accessing that, that, that and that's, so, that's like, so you know, if it's available for the rest of the Arab world, we'd be very happy because $7 billion is a lot of money. 
So maybe we can get some of it here in the region. Uh, well, we, have, we have some great entrepreneurs in Kuwait, and hopefully but so you would we'll have no to make, excuse, to make, make actually, good use of it. Uh, you would have no excuse from, from the entrepreneurship perspective. Well, but Fadi, so you think that, right? So you go back, you're going back to capital. But, but we, we did that survey, and I told you the result of the survey. So it's, it's not lack of capital that's the number one problem. The number one problem entrepreneurs have is government regulations. That's, that's the number one problem that entrepreneurs but what, what have. Would I mean, you it's, do not, it's not a matter of, it's not, it's not an issue that you need to throw money at. It's an issue that we need to make it easier for entrepreneurs to be able to go out there and work. So, so, I, so. In my company, I have over 200 people who deal with, 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 dealing with government bureaucracy. regulations. And bureaucracy. And, and so I have an unfair advantage. Young entrepreneurs don't have that. But, they need somebody. And so one of the things we're looking at now, as part of the SME fund, is setting up a mini ministry in Kuwait for young entrepreneurs. They'll streamline things for, for young entrepreneurs. And, and, and rather than it taking such a long time, making it, make it more of a meritocracy, not a wastocracy within, within the... And, and, that, and that's critical. It's, and that pins down the responsibility of the private sector, because we claim that to be powerful, we rub shoulders with ministers. So why don't we actually rub shoulders and lobby for the ease of this bureaucratic process. I mean, why don't we put we our, our power, because we're so proud of it, into the use because, to, to, to because ease that process? Many, all too many companies are, are comfortable with the position that they're in. Uh, because, are we afraid? Because I, I think many companies are, but they, we shouldn't be. Because if we're afraid of entrepreneurs coming in, then what's going to happen is that we're going to have companies coming in from the outside who are going to eat our lunch. But I, I'd much already, I, it's, as, and that's already and the happening. lunch is being eaten right now. The lunch right is being now. eaten. And, but so what we need to do is we need to make our markets more efficient and more competitive. Because if we don't do that, then we as a region become uncompetitive. And, and we will lose our, we'll, we'll get our lunch taken by somebody and, else. And, and Dr. Mahmoud, you're, you're, you, you come from Libya, and, and the challenges in Libya are completely different than uh, today, than, than they were before, and certainly than the rest of the region. And I'm going to maybe address a little bit of, of politics with you, but more relating to youth, so not, not addressing the problems in, in Libya. Uh, the biggest challenge, uh, and I'll, I'll let you address any issue you want, but the biggest challenge I view in Libya and among the other troubled countries in our neighborhood like Syria, Yemen, and, and Iraq is a lot of our youth have, are holding guns today um, for various reasons. Uh, that worries us all, obviously. Uh, but this is the biggest uh, challenge because these are the future of our countries. How do we actually uh, take away that process of, of being militants uh, to being productive elements in society? And I know in Libya, that's probably the biggest challenge. How do you lay down your weapons as a revolutionary, if you want to call him that, and then become a revolutionary in the economic cycle rather than a revolutionary with a gun? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, the issue of uh, young people in Libya who uh, turned militant and carrying guns today, and some of them refuse to give up those arms. I think uh, it's just, uh, Libya is just a case of, in point. Libya can be repeated in some other countries if we don't pay attention. The world has changed substantially, and we are still doing things the old way. When we talk about SMEs, we talk about SMEs as a solution to a problem of youth. The youth are not a problem. They are the solution. I'm glad when I heard His Majesty this morning talk about Vision 2025, because that's where the whole thing starts. National economies in the Arab world, they don't have vision, most of them. And some of them manage you know, to develop visions, but they don't execute those visions. They are still on the shelves, you know. The function of any vision is to position your economy within the context of the global economy and the regional economy, so you know your competitive edge. At that point, you have an identity of your economy. Then you can start mobilizing your resources around that competitive edge, where you pave your roads, where you build your schools, where you build your hospitals, where you, you plan your cities, it's all crystallized around that identity of the economy. In that sense, our youth can be trained, can be educated, uh, our scientific research can be geared toward that end, but what we do is in a sporadic sense, isolated islands, you know, 
every ministry works on its own. Feeling that we are doing something, spending budgets, but at the end, we talk about GDP. Even in the rentier economy, GDP is a function of getting oil from the ground and selling it. The real GDP is when the economy manages to create jobs. This is the real GDP. Today, I would argue that Daesh is the biggest employer in the Arab world. And this is, this is sad, simply actually, because... Actually, it's the government. <laughs> the, I, I mean, Which the, is the question I wanted to and ask And when we you. talk about education, we still talk about education in the industrial age. Today, we moved from access to knowledge to the management of knowledge, because this explosion of knowledge is much higher and much bigger than any curriculum can contain. There is no single school in the whole world today that has been designed around the concept of uh, management of knowledge. We have to manage complexity, we have to manage diversity, and we have to manage a flow of information. We are not trained to do that. But the new world is completely different. So if we need our kids to be a productive force in a new economy with a certain identity, we better revolutionize our thinking first that we start by positioning ourselves within the context of, of the whole world, two, developing the identity of our economy, three, gearing our educational systems, our training system toward that end. In that sense, you will find that SMEs will be connected to mega projects, so they have the sustainability of growth. But SMEs now just a pain killer, no more than that. And you can ask bankers, the percentage of failure to pay the bank, the bank back. I helped the SMEs in Egypt and Libya and Oman, and I'm acquainted with the cases of failure, simply because it's just a, just a problem when I get rid of it. Keep them out of the street, because if you don't keep them out of the street, then you're going to end up having what happened in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, and in Tunis and Egypt. So we better, because 65 67% of the Arab population, this is a real wealth, and we are wasting it. We are afraid of it. We should embrace it instead. You know? so, but, but, but how do we do that? I mean, how do we, you, you're, you're, so you're a politician and you were a prime minister. How do we move away from uh, aspirational thinking and all these McKinsey studies that come our way and others? Uh, and move them into implementation. What's, what's the problem? I mean, I, I, I've been, you know, I'm, a, I'm a constant conference goer, and I hear uh, constantly government officials telling us about their vision of what needs to be done. And uh, in some countries, it gets done. But the biggest challenge is moving from theory to actually practice and actually implementation. The success of our governments needs to be viewed based on implementation of what they say. Uh, what, stops you from doing that? Is the bureaucracy too powerful and too complacent to actually take the vision of a powerful leader or a visionary leader and actually trickles it down to implementation? What, what, what did you face as a challenge other than, than the gun when you were a prime minister? Or when you were in the previous government in, during the, the different days uh, uh, of pre-Arab pre, pre, pre -Arab Spring? No, uh, we can't take uh, the, the eight months when I was a prime minister as an example. So I, I want Simply I want because yeah. that period was a crisis period. Yeah. There was only a single objective, how to get rid of Gaddafi, how to get rid of the regime. No more than that, you know. There was no time for planning and no time for visioning. Though, before the regime was down, we developed a vision, we called it also 2025. And I can claim that it's one of the best visions developed because we looked at the Jordanian vision, which is, by the way, one of the best also, because it was developed by an NGO and it was financed by a private sector. So the government was not even involved, but the vision was a good one. Uh, the Emirati did a vision, the Qataris did a vision, the Egyptians did three visions, uh, the Omani did a vision. The question is how to translate this vision into concrete plans and you measure up the execution and the progress achieved in the, as a result of that plan every year. We don't do that. We just do a vision as, as a cosmetic thing. But why? Uh, well, uh, I mean, so why, why does government uh, have to uh, give no, us cosmetics? It, it, it's a question when, when uh, the big boss, the king or the president or the leader, whatever the title is, is convinced that he can 
pull in this country because this is a time of crossing. This is a time of crossing. I mean, if you look at Singapore or South Korea, uh, Singapore started in 1965. All Arab countries were independent in 1965. But where is Singapore today? Singapore is just a few rocks in the sea. They don't, even, they don't even have water, you know, to drink. They do recycling. So the question is the vision of that leader. If he can trust a group of experts in his country and have the, this group of experts surrounding him all the time, listen to them. Because I can put my money in this, the security of any regime today depends on the issue of development and the issue of inclusion. It's not security apparatus anymore. It's not armies. They did not serve Gaddafi. They did not serve Mubarak. And they did not serve uh, Bin Ali or Ali uh, Abdullah Saleh. So what I'm saying, what's, what took place in those four or five cases, uprising, Arab uprising, this is just the beginning. And we are having now some sort of a recess because what took place and the inclusion of Daesh, the insertion of Daesh to the scene, but I think as long as those structural problems we have in our economy, we have in our government, we have in our social systems and our cultural system to defeat Daesh or to defeat terrorism, it's a holistic approach. It's not a question of guns. You have to give those kids an alternative. And that's why you ask it how those kids can give up their arms. They give up their arms, uh, give them an alternative make them feel that they are part of the future of their own country. Include them in the process. But if you are afraid of this and that, uh, those people, if they get educated, then they're going to be a threat to the regime, the security of the regime. The more awakening of the, of the street, this is to, uh, No, what I'm saying, the new age, the new paradigm is saying, knowledge is all over the place. You cannot prevent it. Ideologies are out of place, uh, boundaries are out of place, even flags. Today, my kid can chat with anybody all over the world. No police in the world can prevent him. Not only this, our apparatus, uh, security apparatus were built around the concept that even the oppositions, we know their headquarters. So we can Thank you. arrest them at any moment. Today, you have a virtual party. The guy who's in China and who's in the Emirates and who's in Libya and who's in Morocco, they are in one party and they are chatting. Place and time are irrelevant anymore. So it's a new world, but we are dealing with it with the old And the tools. solutions are always local. The, the solutions are there. Are always local, because we can't blame the virtual world. No, no, no. no, no, no. Let, let, let me go to Princess Carolina, and then I'll get back with another round. So Princess Carolina, your work is with UNRWA. We all know the work of UNRWA. It has been uh, around, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on who, how you're looking at it, for, for decades now. How can we take the experience that UNRWA has had, specifically with education in Lebanon and Jordan and, and uh, with Palestinian uh, refugees, uh, and apply it to the massive challenge that we have with the youth uh, that are coming uh, to Jordan and Lebanon today uh, that are probably a lost generation now, because most of them are not even uh, going to school. In Lebanon, there are more school children, uh, aged Syrian school children kids than there are Lebanese. The school system in Jordan and in Lebanon cannot absorb them. So, and we're talking about youth. Uh, how do we actually not lose that generation uh, uh, in, 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 in the coming uh, three or four years? Because apparently the problem in Syria is going to take a while. Thank you for that question. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, it's uh, UNRWA is celebrating its 65th anniversary this year, um, which means that the issue of the Palestine refugees has um, been there for, for that long, even a little bit longer. Um, so there are lots of lessons to be learned from that. Just to get back to the, your question, what can we learn from the work that UNRWA has done with Palestine refugees um, during crisis situations? I'd just like to highlight a report that was issued by the World Bank last year that has indicated that the level of education that UNRWA provides under the circumstances that it provides the education to the children, 
during conflict and um, other problematic um, periods is extremely high. Now, why is that relevant to your question? It means that during uh, conflict, during displacement, education is seen by organizations such as UNRWA as one of the most important elements that we have to continue doing and providing. Because um, looking at the youth and looking at providing good education to children is obviously uh, providing hope for the children themselves, but obviously for their families as well. Um, so what can we learn from UNRWA in the cases of the current crisis is that um, it is important and it is it's worth investing and in especially that it's possible. So what I would urge in this case with what is happening now is really um, with the public-private partnerships that we're discussing in these couple of days is for the private sector also to help support the youth in the region uh, through these institutions. How do you think they can do that? Well, by providing um, assistance either through knowledge, uh, networking, uh, financial means to those institutions that provide education. I just want to highlight, uh, just continuing on that, education is one of the most important. I think everybody agrees it's not a, it's not a difficult topic to, to discuss. What is difficult, though, is that once you've finished education, and even if it's high level of education, we still need access to the job market. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges for Palestinian refugees these days. Um, what can we learn from UNRWA again in the current crisis? We don't want to repeat that for the Syrian refugees. We don't want to repeat that for any other of the refugees. So integration as much as possible in the societies, if we can. Um, integration to the job market, giving people hope and dignity especially, uh, is crucial. And related to that is also investing much more in women. Young girls, um, UNRWA has all, since 1960 had 50% female participation in schools, which is also remarkable. And that needs to increase and, and be sustained by the uh, entire region. And to come back to a point that you raised earlier with um, my colleague here, what can be done in terms of women participation? We had a gender session this morning, um, and we discussed that a little bit. I think what, what needs to be done there is that more men need to speak up for the participation of women. How? In how? I mean, what, what is it that we're not doing? You're not talking enough about <laughs> it. It's we're not talking a, a lot what? And enough about gender. So it's a, it's a men issue relating to women? I think what the issue is is that many women talk about it, and many women talk amongst themselves about it. but. We would like to see more men talk about but, but, it. But let me ask you a question, and, and you might not know it because you, you don't necessarily live amongst us, but it, what is it uh, that you think does not get women to move from their college to a job, and then the 50% the, the college graduates fall into 18% participation in the economic uh, cycle? Uh, what happens? Why, why, is this, why, why do you think there is that gap? Is it that there is a, a clear discrimination against employment of women? Uh, or is it that women uh, also, well, they're home, home makers, so that we don't want to uh, underestimate the power of the necessity of, of choosing to be a homemaker. So that's a choice also. Uh, what do we do? I mean, what, what, what are we missing? Do you, is, what does Europe do? So, I mean, I why do you have higher participation uh, than, than we do? A little bit higher. I mean, the problems are the same worldwide. I don't think you, we can make a huge distinction. So a societal change, for sure. Um, as I think was mentioned before as well, it's not only, um, it's, it's also just providing better um, work conditions. So, you know, more uh, childcare provisions, uh, flexible working hours, etc. But it's also just understanding why it's beneficial to have women in the workforce. It's not just having a quota of 50-50, that's not the most important thing. It's also understanding what the benefits are of having a mixed board, let's say, at the, at the CEO level. Or, uh, and that's one of the things that is a question of education, I think. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to go back to, to ask everyone about the education. The, the ILO, uh, a report from the World Bank, tells us in, in, uh, on jobs in 2013. It says the main focus uh, of education systems continues to be the production of future employees 
for the public sector. This is a general statement by the World Bank that says education systems are producing people who are actually, uh, 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 their knowledge base is to work in the public sector. And the public sector in some countries uh, is, is uh, employing anywhere between 80 and 50% of the workforce. So that's, uh, and then I want to discuss that story. But I want to also go through and get you to comment on uh, the recently published uh, ASDA uh, Arab Youth Survey. They, they, a couple of months ago it came out couple of questions that are of interest to us on youth. So the, they asked a the question, how concerned would you say you are about employment? Asking youth, ages 18 to 22. The answer came 81%, I'm, I'm concerned. So youth are obviously concerned. And it's not only a general statement, it's also in the GCC where probably employment in certain countries are higher. It's 73% in the GCC, it's bigger in the it's a bigger uh, challenge in the Levant countries here in this part of the world. And then the, the next question says, how confident are you in your government's ability to deal with unemployment? So suddenly you plug in government into the process. How is government able to deal with unemployment? And the question in the GCC is 68% of the people of the GCC tell you we are very confident that the government is going to resolve it. And 61% in non-GCC countries. So, while policymakers continuously tell us we don't want to employ people in the public sector, we want them to be employed in the private sector. So there is a question on, of misperception here. One, education systems are not giving the skills that are needed for the private sector. And then uh, everyone that is not getting a job is telling us we think government effectively, we are very confident that government is going to resolve it. So there is, it's a paradox. Uh, what are the skills that are missing to employ people in the private sector? And what, what do we do to change the education system uh, to move it from, uh, for, uh, for, for, employ to, for employability, specifically in the Gulf? The Gulf, there's a big challenge of expatriates uh, having the majority of the jobs and the nationals working in government. How do we change that formula? Boudour. Um, I think we need to overhaul our education system, that's for sure. But I think it's a collective responsibility. So it's not just the government's responsibility. I think everybody should play a role in that. And um, I mean, I heard this, uh, this interesting story once about um, somebody who was interviewing candidates for a job, and he interviewed candidate after candidate, and they were all not suitable, and he decided to go to the university to ask them what kind of students they're producing. And they said, well, don't look at us. This is how we got them from school. So he goes to school and the school says, well, don't look at us. This is how we inherited them from middle school. You know where this is going, right? <laughs> so he goes, don't look at us. This is how we got them from, from preschool. And he goes to preschool and he asks them, how come those students are not prepared for the job market? And they say, well, this is how our, their parents gave them to us. So actually the role is, is universal, it's collective. So parents have a, a large role to play, uh, governments, the private sector, uh, civil society. <laughs> it's a collective responsibility. Why, why isn't it being done? I mean, uh, we all know that, that that's, that's the problem. What's the missing link? Who, who is really not doing his thing to actually take it to the next, next level? Because the challenge in a digitized world is no longer a 21st century, a 20th century issue. The 21st century is at, at moving at an accelerated uh, mode that requires a revolution in the education system rather than a slow process of reform that effectively keeps us where we are because the world is moving much faster than we are. So we all agree, right, that we need critical skills for the 21st century. That's something that we all agree that we need. So that's something that's out there at the table. But we also need an entrepreneurial spirit. I think that's missing in our part of the world. And an interesting documentary that was made called The Lemonade Stories interviewed successful entrepreneurs and their mothers. And it goes to show how their mothers really influenced these people, like Richard Branson, for example. And the culture at home and in the parents' influence onto their children actually determines whether they're entrepreneurial or not. 
and also the you know not being afraid to take risks. That's something Omar pointed at, pointed on this morning, and I think that's something that's missing in our part of the world. If we look at places like South Korea, and I think we spoke about that, and Malaysia and Singapore, they invested in their people before investing in infrastructure. So they built their people first, and then the people built their nation. So it's doable. It just takes time, and I think we need to work slowly at it, and we need a catalyst to speed things up. Omar, what 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 do you need? What sort of skills do you need? <coughs> or you require in the, pri in the private sector, in your company, in your bank, to employ more of the graduates from your country? What, what, is, it, what is it that, they, that the education system is not giving them? And let me uh, throw a bit of controversy here. There is a massive movement that says we need to protect our Arabic language and don't, don't get excited, uh, and we do. Uh, I, I also worry about that, but I also tell you, if you don't speak English, you're not gonna get employed. And that, that paradox is another story altogether. So we want to protect our language, but employability means you need to speak languages, specifically English, you need to have computer skills, uh, and you need to have other technical skills like critical thinking, solutions thinking. Tell us. So, I, I think we need to stop looking at our ministries of education as, as places to put, um, uh, you know, the, 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 we, need to stop think, we need to start thinking about them as places where we put our very best people. I mean, if you look across the Gulf, uh, there's no teacher proficiency exams. Uh, so, you know, we, our KPIs are wrong. We're measuring the wrong thing. And you run a business, buddy, and, and you, you typically get what you measure. So if you measure the amount of desks, the amount of school buildings, that's what you're going to get. And, and we have a lot of desks, we have a lot of school buildings, and we have a lot of teachers. But we don't measure quality. And the touch point where you get the traction is the teacher that interacts with the kids. And, and unfortunately, we, we don't have KPIs around the quality of teachers. And I haven't seen that in any nation in the Gulf, at least. I, I don't know broader than that. But in the Gulf, I can speak to that. And so I think that's one area where we really need to improve on the quality of the teachers that are interacting with the kids. But I, I still think there's a lot the private sector can do in order to skill, skill kids up. Because it's easy to point to governments and say, hey, look, we're not getting the quality of the people that we need, so we can't employ them. But I think. There's a lot of skills that we can, there's a lot of skilling that we can do as private sector in order to be able to give people skills. So at the Regional Business Council here at, at the WEF, um, we, we put a goal in to have 100,000 youth affected by, by the region, by the, Honda yeah, Mantaka, Right. And it, we, we now are already 55% of the way there, and we hope to get more than 100% of the way there by Davos. And it's by just, by utilizing the bandwidth of people's organizations for training. There's a lot of bandwidth within the private sector, and, and how to allocate that bandwidth and use that bandwidth for training and, and do something about it. Because like you said, it's easy to sit there and diagnose a problem, and the problem is pretty obvious. But what do we do about it? And how do we as a private sector look at our responsibility? It's our neighborhood. This is where we live. How do we affect some change? And, and so there's, I think, a lot more we can be doing as private sector people in order to skill people, in order to help people. And there's some great programs, some great NGOs out there that, that, that we can support. And our organizations can bring in more, uh, more uh, uh, people at the grade school, high school level, uh, and volunteers. Do, do, do we yeah. need to, don't we need to participate as private sector in the curriculum setting with government? I mean, is, is, do you, is there uh, something in Kuwait where you actually participate with the government in saying, no. here are the skills we need, and the, here's what we need you to actually teach our kids? Is no. that, does that exist? Does, does, does anyone ask you, what is it that you want these kids to learn so that you can employ them? So you're, you're asking me a question that you know the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> and I, they don't. No. So, and, and I personally haven't seen it anyway. No, yeah, I mean, we have. And that's, that's so, a big so, gap. I, you know, I, I think that we also have a problem, Fadi, with, with, with our youth in that they, they lack imagination. Our entrepreneurs lack imagination. So I, I, I touched on a survey earlier on. And, and one of the questions we asked these 2,200 youth across the region was that if you could do any business and you're guaranteed to succeed in this business, what business would it be? And one, two, and three were retail, something in retail, real estate, and F&B. And information technology was number five. And we even sliced it amongst the type of degrees that people had, whether high school degrees, bachelor degrees, master's degrees, or PhDs. And it actually didn't shift much across degrees. So I think we need to have examples of entrepreneurs 
people who role models. success role models, role models. People, like, like you Fadi people have gone out there and started up companies and and people have gone out like the Talabats of the world people who've started up technology companies and hold them up as role models as opposed to the the real estate developers and the the, the retailers because where where we're going to create our next Google where we're going to create our next uber is going to be around the technology space and we need more role models around the technology space to have people try to emulate and try to head towards thank you uh, Dr. Mahmoud, you've been, you've been involved in training for a good amount of your career, other than being a politician. Um, and I'm supposed, I tried to research to discover what training you do. I couldn't figure it out, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that you've been training public sector employees. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what is it, uh, why do you train public sector employees? I mean, what is it that they're missing? Do, do these, are, these, are these people uh, trainable so that they can move into the private sector? Is there that much of a big cultural difference between people that work in the private sector and the public sector that, that we're missing in here? That well, unfortunately, most of the public sector institutions, they train simply because they have budgets, no more than that. You know. Ah, so they train for that for but because they need no, to spend the money. But there is no strategy to reform the public sector to make it more efficient. I'll give you an example. When a trainee comes back after he finishes a certain training workshop and he goes back to his, his work, if he even dares to try to implement what he learned during those two, three weeks, uh, I mean, somebody would tell him just... Uh, <laughs> be quiet, you know. It's been like that for a while, you know. They go for training because there is an allowance. They go for training because there is budget. And they go for training because it's good, you know, to do shopping and sometimes you take your family. But I would say that Arab management from 1965 until today, the amount of billions which been invested in training is much more than anybody can think. And the state of Arab management today is much worse than it was before 1965. Why? Because the management at that time was inherited from a colonial period. There was still some systems. So colonialism was good? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, this is a fishing in, no, I'm, I'm, in different I'm, waters. So, but <laughs> but uh, I just want to go back to your uh, question about education reform. I don't think it's only about education. Education is just part of, 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 the, of the whole picture. What I think we really need is restructuring the socialization process in our countries, the way we bring our kids in our homes, the media, the way we understand and interpret religion, because in the absence of a progressive understanding of religion like the school of Ibn Rushd, what we have is the school of Ibn Taymiyyah and what he's doing in our sites today. Then you have education, because these are the four industries that produce values, that shape behavior and attitudes for human beings. You cannot have state-of-the-art education and the kid receive the contradictory message from the media and from his parents at home. You know. So there should be some source of compatibility between those four factors, producing the same skills, the same attitude, which is, should be compatible. The question at the end, do you want those kids to be on your side as a productive force to rebuild your country, rebuild your economy, or you want them to be part of Daesh in the future? Thank you very much. And that question comes to you, Princess Carolina. So what is it? So the Palestinians have suffered for decades and you have a, a whole generation of productive Palestinians that have graduated from UNRWA schools that are on the side of productivity, highly educated. The UNRWA schools are famous for having a very powerful education system. Uh, what, what have, I mean, even though they are refugees and refugees are normally angry and they should come out and actually be very angry, while you have Palestinians all over the world building countries and being entrepreneurs and being very productive. What is it about that? I think it's, um, it, there is a, a culture of education and seeing the importance of education very, very strongly amongst the Palestinians. Um, so uh, talking about the holistic approach, family really fosters the importance of education for their children. So they have invested a lot in that, not only the refugees. Um, what 
Um, the problem is, um, and I know we're not supposed to talk only about the problems, but the, the, the issue with Palestinian refugees in particular is that the education is good. They have, um, and I think the, we all try to see youth as a potential and not as a problem. Um, and that's one of the emphasis that we would really want to make. But if you don't end the occupation, if you don't end the blockage of Gaza, if you don't uh, deal with the civil war in Syria, then um, there is very little that people with a refugee status can actually do. And um, that is something that we collectively have to look into um, and not rely only on international organizations such as UNRWA to resolve. Thank you very much. And, and I'm going to get some questions from the floor. But before I do that, talking about uh, re resolving these issues, the, the, the Arab Youth Survey came out, again, with these, with these conclusions for, for this year. It says, how do you feel about the future of your country? So talking about uh, how, how do the youth look at their country? 63% of the youth, just because we talk about their problems, well, 63% tell us they're positive. They are positive. They think the future of their country, 63% of them, are positive. They're either optimistic, they're excited, or hopeful. That questions were, were quite positive. So, so youth apparently think more than we do, who are much above their average age, think that there is something that's happening. And then another question says, on the long run, 67% of youth say our best days are ahead of us. So I mean, they're basically saying today is not great, but 67% is ahead of us. 70% of those people are in the GCC. 57% are here in the, in the Levant. So even among all the problems that we are facing in the region, uh, they, we still see 50 majority of people still say they're optimistic. And 73% in North Africa think the, the, the better the future is ahead of them, that there is a positive element out there. And then most importantly here, I think, for this discussion, uh, and then I'll, take, uh, I'll bring out the questions, is there was a question that was posed. Do you intend to start your own business in the next five years? That's a, an important question, because everyone thinks people want to work in the public sector. 39%, which is a staggering number, say yes. So something is that these people have that uh, hope and aspiration to actually start a business. There is a failure somewhere else to translate that into action. And then people decide to go into the public sector or actually don't start a business. But most of them are actually, 16% of these people want to be in, in, uh, in high tech and 15% in retail. So there is a positive story here among on the youth in the Arab world. And I will conclude with that. I will thank you all, but I'm going to take some. We have about five or six minutes for questions. And uh, do we have a microphone anywhere here? Yes, we have a microphone. Questions? <laughs> There's one here, and there one then. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Don't, don't be shy. And then the next one comes here. And then we'll take a couple of questions, no comments, unless you really, really, really feel about you need to comment, and then you have five seconds to comment. Definitely, we have to give the opportunity to everybody to ask questions. Don't worry. No, we so have five minutes, so, so I could, <laughs> we could, you know. I'm Youssef, Global Shaper from Robat in Morocco, and I'm, uh, thank you for such a discussion. So my question is related to educational system. If you have the opportunity, and this question to everybody in the panel, if you have the opportunity to create a new educational system, that will allow young people in our region to grow. What kind of components you're going to put in such a system? And if this system exists today, then please share it as well. Thank you. Please. Uh, well, anyone can choose Go to ahead. answer. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think we need to stop looking at education as a competition and, and look at comp more as a collaboration, uh, because the skills that we need in the real world are collaborative. And we're all trained in all of our educations to compete with each other. And it's a competition between each other. And I think we, we ought to find ways to, be, to learn how to be more collaborative and get those critical thinking skills, but yet learn how to work together and how to get things done. Thank you. 
That, does anyone feel that they want to say I something? Just, uh, I just want to add quickly that it's so interesting to have the global shapers here, and I hope maybe next year in the session to have them speak at the youth exactly. panel because we really want to hear from them, actually. Uh, yeah. Okay, so next. <laughs> Well, uh, You're also a global shaper. Another global you look shaper. like one. From I mean, you all have the same look here. <laughs> really? <laughs> from Tripoli, Libya. Uh, Mohammed Hamouda. From Tripoli uh, in Libya? Yes. Yes. Uh, my question is about uh, how we, what's your um, perception and um, thoughts about including social entrepreneurs in, uh, in, um, pro in, as a solution for providing can I turn the question to you and tell you what do you think we need to do with Libyan youth to put them in the productive side of society? Because you're okay. part of the youth and the question is to you because I would have loved you to be on the panel with us. Okay. Thank Go you ahead. for uh, tell us. the question. You have one minute. Well, <laughs> actually, I think the most important thing is inclusion and include youth in decision making and also in the process of analyzing the, the problems because we... One of the main problems we think that we know the problem, but in fact, the problems we don't know them yet. This is the first thing. The second thing is so you need to be asked. Yes. Nobody talks to you. To be to be asked and to be involved, and the second thing is like learning by doing. Because what, lately UNDP has done a, a survey about the uh, civil society mapping in Libya, and we realized that the number of civil society in Libya per people are more than our neighbors in Tunisia and in Egypt. So this is, was one so of is the civil society running civil the country today? Well, we hope so, but uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> That's we, a good answer. we are not. So this is one of the things. It's like learning by doing and also inclusion. Thank I you think very we much. will receive the, the, the right you. solution. Thank you. Next. We'll have the lady here. What, what? Hon. Yes. You're a global shaper? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, Where are you from? I'm Asma, a global shaper from Gaza Hub. Uh, uh, so my question to you is that um, we have, uh, like most of the panel said, is that entrepreneurship and the focus on SMEs is the future because it constitutes a large percentage of the different countries. But my question to you, don't you think that it is dangerous to assume that entrepreneurship alone will be the future of the MENA region? as a way to solve the different problems that we are solving. And if, if it's not alone, what should be accompanied with uh, uh, entrepreneurship? So are you challenging the question that entrepreneurship is actually a solution, uh, the only solution? Yes. So what is the, what, if it's not, then what do you think should be the solution? Exactly, and especially- Tell us, I want you to tell us. Okay. Uh, just a minute, but uh, first, <laughs> first... No, I mean, because uh, I mean, it's important that we hear you out. We were yes. only giving you five minutes, and we're sorry for that. No, it's fine. Uh, as, as global shapers, but your voice needs to be heard. We are promoting promo uh, entrepreneurship, but the question is that how many successes has been on entrepreneurship in, in the MENA regions? And if, if we are looking at the success, how many failures has happened? And what are the causes of the failures? And how it affected the dreams of the young people who come up with the entrepreneurship, dreaming that it is the solution, but we left them in a, bad, uh, in a worse situation than before. I do believe in entrepreneurship, and uh, I want to start something called Entrepreneurship Seeds, or Gaza Seeds Through Entrepreneurship Program, but it's not alone enough. Uh, are you involved with the Gaza Sky Geeks? Yes, I'm a mentor there. And it's a fantastic program. It is fantastic, but the, the point is that we bring these people, we, told them about, we talk to them about entrepreneurship, we give them training, and we give them seed funds, but after that, what happens? Occupation. Occupations, yes, and also other things around. So we give them hope, but we leave them in midway. We don't support them the whole way. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are out of time, and, and we have to end here. Thank you very much, panelists. Brilliant. <laughs>